You are listening to the Mother of All Talk Shows podcast with George Galloway. Go figure, as Joe Biden said when he announced to the American people that somebody called Rashid Sanouk had been <laughs> elected, not quite the right word, as the Prime Minister of Britain. I don't know what Joe would have said when the wafer-thin 52-48 result came through that the new chief minister, first minister of Scotland is somebody called Hamza Youssef. And Hamza Youssef, a Pakistani, is now about to fight Rashid Sanouk, an Indian, over whether to partition Britain. Well, it worked so well in the Indian subcontinent, after all. Why not try it here in the mother country? Just as a matter of interest, the leader of the opposition in the Scottish Parliament is also a Pakistani, a Starmerite. Now, they're all, people are getting up ahead of uh, Islamophobic steam about Hamza Yusuf. They're very peculiar kinds of Muslims, these fellows. Hamza Youssef and uh, 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 the uh, Labour uh, leader, the leader of the opposition, Anna Sarwar. Very odd. They're both super woke. They both believe and voted for it and whipped their members to vote for it. That a man can become a woman just by declaring uh, that he is. They both supported, until very recently, uh, the idea that if someone did declare themselves a woman... If they were sentenced to prison, it must be on the women's prison estate. Both of them uh, are uh, LGBTQ++++ rainbow freaks. Uh, So the fact that they are nominally Muslim is actually the least of our problems in Scotland. The fact is that Hamza Youssef has been a failure in every single job that he's had, and he's had many. He has been drummed out of every one of them. He is a classic example of someone being promoted to the ranks of their last failure. Every failure has led to a promotion. And so much so that having now just departed as the health secretary, he has appointed as his successor someone to be the health and recovery secretary. That's how bad the Scottish Health Service is almost as bad as the Scottish Education Service. The Scottish Transport System, almost as bad, though you'd have to go some to be as bad, as Scotland's drugs death record. Where do you think the worst record of death from drugs in the world is? You think it's in Colombia? You think it's in Mexico City? You think it's in amongst the cartels in the Latin American jungles? No. The drugs death capital of the world is SNP-ruled Scotland. The children that are growing up in poverty have multiplied. Their number has multiplied over the 13 years of SNP rule. Of course, they like to blame everything on England. That's going to be a bit tricky when it's a Pakistani blaming an Indian for being English, but they'll have a go. The reality is that Scottish devolution has completely abysmally failed. I was there. I was one of its pioneers, one of its advocates. It was intended as a means of giving Scottish people devolved government within the United Kingdom. It was never designed to withstand 13 years of political control by a party determined to use the platform and the resources given by the taxpayers in England to actually break up the country, all the while blaming the English people whose money they were using to keep the whole show on the road. We'll keep you posted on how that's going. i just make this point. It was a very narrow result. The last time there was a very narrow result in the EU referendum, funnily enough, by exactly the same numbers, 52 to 48. The SNP said that that margin of error was so slight that there had to be a second referendum. 
watch out for someone going to court in Scotland to demand a recount and to demand a rerun of this most grotesque of contests that we have just endured. The French, of course, don't endure. They fight back. The fight back of the French people would be thrilling and encouraging people all over the so-called Western world if only they could see it, which is the reason why they cannot see it. It is the reason why uh, television stations like RT are off the air in France as well as in Britain, indeed in many parts of the Western world, but not all. In the United States, for example, you can still see RT. How funny is that? But in Britain, you'd go to prison for even giving an interview to a reporter from RT. And now we know the real reason. The uprising in France, the revolution in France. This is a new French revolution. If they had had television cameras in 1789, this is what it would have looked like. Our own editor was actually gassed on the streets of a rural area in France. Just yesterday, he was gassed. He was only there to take a look on behalf of the mother of all talk shows. That's his pictures there. But he couldn't take that many because he got tear gas fired in his face, in his eyes. He was lucky that the canister went over his head or he might have been gravely injured or worse. The French people are not deterred by this kind of thing. Neither are they likely to be deterred by the latest twist. Macron's thugs, otherwise known as police, have arrested a young woman for sending out a Twitter post that called the President of the Republic garbage. That's actually the least you could describe him as. This popinjay, petty prince, who sits on his golden throne in Versailles like a latter-day Louis XVI, wearing his 80,000 euro watch and then having to slip it off mid-interview as someone was rapidly signaling to him from the wings that it wasn't a good look wearing a watch that expensive whilst demanding that the French people should accept more and more austerity while sending billions and billions of their money to Zelensky in Ukraine. The French people are not putting up with it anymore. When it does get into the Western media, it's described as a protest about pensions. Like all these young people are on the streets of Paris every day and night about a pension they may or may not live to collect 40 or 45 years hence. It's not about pensions. It's about the whole package. It's about NATO. It's about Ukraine. It's about austerity, privatization, the policies of the rich, for the rich, by the rich, against the interests of the vast majority of the people of France. Mind you, it hasn't yet spread to the United States of America. There, it takes a morbid and, uh, and I don't know how to put it delicately. A deadly identity politics hue where a young woman goes into a school and murders three small children and three teachers in the school before being shot dead by the police and the entire Liberati want to argue about whether she should be called a young woman or a young man because she had declared she was no longer a she, but a he. Talk about 21st century problems. Talk about first world problems. This was the 129th mass shooting in America with automatic weapons since the beginning of the year, and it's only March. 129 mass shootings, killing little children as they hide under their desks in the schoolroom, or it takes the form, morbid form, of, of uh, racial violence, of the murder of black people 
by uh, United States law enforcement uh, officials, otherwise known as the mob, otherwise known as organized crime, working for the capo in the White House, the head of the Biden crime family, Joseph Biden. You think I'm exaggerating? Did you see the news this very week that the Bidens received a sweetheart loan of $500,000 from a Ukrainian garagist, a Ukrainian second-hand car salesman lent the family of the President of the United States half a million dollars to secure the liens on their beachfront properties in Florida. You could not make this up. Hunter Biden, Joe Biden, Joe Biden's brother, God knows how many other Bidens have got their noses in the Ukrainian trough, in the Ukrainian nose bag to such an extent if they were lawyers, they'd have to recuse themselves from any further dealings with the Ukrainian file. I've only got time to turn to the funniest story of the week. Joe Biden is currently holding a democracy summit in Southern Africa. That's right. In the very place where the United States and the United Kingdom, and France, and all the other so-called West, supported racist, apartheid, white supremacist states, right up until the very end. Margaret Thatcher, I was there, saw her lips move, called Nelson Mandela a common terrorist. The United States took Mandela off the terrorist list in 2008. In the 18th year of his presidency of the Republic of South Africa. And I got to thinking when I saw a very harrowing picture posted by one of my friends on Twitter earlier this evening. It's a picture that deserves to be seen far more widely. You'll find it on my Twitter feed. It's a picture of the Congo's first Prime Minister, Patrice Lumumba, half naked, in shackles, being pushed down aircraft steps by a Belgian military officer after his overthrow in a coup organized and executed by Britain, Belgium, and the United States of America. The newly elected President Jack Kennedy knew nothing of this coup and the CIA defied him, lied to him and conducted this coup behind their new president's back. But it happened. The CIA, MI6 and the hated Belgian colonist government that was finally having to leave power took this fine man, probably the greatest of all African leaders, and murdered him. They then dismembered him. They then dissolved him in acid and sent one of his teeth back to Brussels for safekeeping, for DNA. It was only returned to the Congo last year. The West murdered Patrice Lumumba. The West helped keep Nelson Mandela in prison for 27 years, most of them on uh, Devil's Island, Robben Island, in the dungeons of apartheid. The West supported racist apartheid rule in the very southern Africa. They're now holding a summit in to tell Africans how important their democracy is. There's the picture of the hero Patrice Lumumba being led down the steps of that aircraft to his death, his dismemberment, and his dissolving in acid. You couldn't make it up. And they wonder why Africans are utterly unmoved at their pleas to reject 
China and Russia and embrace them instead? China never occupied a square inch of Africa. Russia never occupied a square inch of Africa. As a matter of fact, when the West was supporting apartheid and white supremacist rule in southern Africa, it was the Russians who were arming, financing, and providing the diplomatic skeleton backbone for the worldwide activities of the anti-apartheid movement, of the movement for liberation in Southern Africa. I have many times spoken at the Patrice Lumumba University for the Friendship of the Peoples. It's not in San Francisco. It's not in London, and it certainly isn't in Brussels. It's in Moscow. It's in Russia. I have been there spoken there many times. Does that little vignette not explain something to you, the viewers and the wider public about why the Africans will never hate Russia, will never hate China? China is building roads, railways, terminals, ports, harbors, infrastructure all over Africa. All the so-called West did was loot it and steal even the people of Africa themselves, chained them in the holds of ships, sailed them through the middle passage, tossing thousands of them overboard when they died as food for the sharks. And then those lucky enough to reach land were placed as beasts of burden in chains as slaves. You want Africans to support you, Mr. Biden, Mr. Sunak, Miss von der Leyen, Mr. Borrell, the people you just described as the people of the jungle while you sat in your garden. How does your garden grow now, Mr. Borrell? Have you seen the streets of France? We'll be talking about all of this because this is the mother of all talk shows. You are listening to the mother of all talk shows podcast with George Galloway. What an astounding poll we're running this evening. Who will be the first to fall? A. Macron. B. Netanyahu. C. Sunak. And 17,358 people have voted and the show has only just begun. Who will be the first to fall? A, Macron, B, Netanyahu, C, Sunak. The answer might not be the obvious one. Now, our first guest this evening, his uh, first time guest, is such a Renaissance man, such a man of the world. It'll take me five minutes to introduce him. He is... Denis Rogatyuk, he's a Russian, Australian, political commentator, journalist, filmmaker, and international director of El Ciudadno. And he's in Latin America. Denis, welcome. We, we must make you our world global affairs correspondent. Thank you very much indeed for joining us. Uh, let's, Thank you so uh, if much, we George. can talk uh, uh, about your one of your countries, Australia. Uh, I was in China uh, for a week, just back, uh, and uh, there's a lot of talk uh, in China about the sheer illogicality, isn't the word, uh, unhinged Australian obsession against China. When China is Australia's biggest trading partner, has never lifted a finger against Australia, has no bad intentions whatsoever towards Australia. Why are your countrymen so hot under the collar uh, about a country that they actually should be cozying up to and getting along well with? Well, George, I believe that uh, uh, one 
One, one very uh, say particular explanation for this is the fact that Australia has blindly followed in the footsteps of the United States in almost every, every single military and diplomatic aggression against other countries in the world since the times of the, of the Korean War. Uh, the Australian uh, troops have have been involved in virtually every single conflict that uh, that the United States has ever been uh, involved in or military militarily intervened uh, in Korean War, Vietnam Vietnam War, Iraq War, the war in, the war in Afghanistan, and uh, other uh, smaller military conflicts. Uh, one particular explanation uh, for this is, is I'd say, the overwhelming do dominance of the American capital. Uh, here in uh, here in Australia, and it has become uh, such a uh, such a such a, such a strong component of the Australian uh, foreign policy that it has virtually become uh, unquestionable uh, by uh, either one of the, either of the two uh, major political parties uh, here 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 in Australia. With regards to this uh, latest uh, deal, which is which is part of the um, uh, the Australia, US, and uh, UK alliance, so or AUKUS, uh, the purchase uh, and the purchase of the nuclear submarines uh, by the uh, by the Australian uh, government, supposedly to deter Chinese uh, military aggression. Imagine uh, uh, whatever, whatever whatever may whatever that may uh, be. Uh, whatever, <laughs> as 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 the as as you said, uh, George. Uh, China has not invaded or militarily occupied any country in the uh, in, in the Southeast Asia. Despite this, despite this, uh, the Australian government is still keen on uh, the purchase on the purchase of these submarines, valued at approximately th approximately three hundred and sixty billion dollars as part of the AUKUS uh, oh. alliance. And as, as as you also mentioned, this this puts Australia in a paradoxical position, whereby whereby it is it, it is effectively uh, is effectively fulfilling the interests of of the U.S. capital in its battle in, in its own battle against uh, the rising Chinese hegemony uh, across uh, across Asia. It's. Uh, it is it, it is it is truly it is truly uh, paradoxical, but uh, we have but 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 we have to remember that Australia uh, was always uh, in the vanguard of U.S. imperialism across the world and continues to be so, uh, in the, except that in the case of of a potential of any potential conflict uh, with China, I believe it would it would actually be Australia. Uh, that that would suffer. That would suffer. Would be the country that would suffer the most among any of the other Western uh, countries. Now that's a lot of Australian dollars to hand over to the British and American arms manufacturers. Three hundred and sixty billion uh, dollars. Uh, do the Australian people have no other need for that money? Is everything hunky dory down under? Well, George, uh, according to uh, the uh, to, to, to major to the two uh, major political parties of, of Australia, that is the Liberal Party and the and the Labour Party, it certainly it certainly seems that uh, Australia has has this cash to spare. Uh, unfortunately, hopefully, hopefully there are still you know there are still some uh, some uh, you know voices political political voices in the Parliament uh, that. Uh, you know, that actually they actually show that actually show the uh, uh, that that is that is not the case. Uh, one of the in one of the uh, latest um, uh, Q and A uh, shows here here in Australia, uh, Senate Senator uh, uh, Jordan uh, Jordan Steele, who is a senator for the Greens Party, uh, actually actually pointed out uh, it was first of all the absurdity of the three hundred sixty billion dollars worth of a deal, but also. Of the of the needs of the desperate of the desperate need uh, to fund uh, the uh, the various you know social services uh, in in Australia the disability services the the uh, the health services really the need uh, for uh, for in, for investment in the in the infra in the infrastructure uh, in Aust in Australia something that uh, something it's uh, also uh, I'm, I must also say. Uh, 
that Australia has always has also been uh, very pretty much prevented from accessing the funds of the Belt and Road Initiative uh, by the United States. So the Belt and Road Initiative of China, which could uh, eno- help Australia enormously, uh, has also been uh, denied to it uh, by uh, by the United States. There's there's have also been the words of the former Prime Minister Paul Keating. Who, uh, who also, who also point, pointed out that uh, China does not represent a military threat to Australia. Um, so, the uh, uh, so in in effect, in, in essence, uh, this is you know this deal. This deal is all about uh, the this this deal is all about you know uh, the United States and and the United Kingdom. You know, pushing uh, pushing Australia right, uh, you know, right right onto the edge, right and right and right in, in the vanguard of any of any military uh, conflict uh, with China. If yeah, well, if, uh, if of mil- course they're they're trying to push you. Uh, they're trying to push you into alliance with uh, one of the uh, middle distance neighbors, Japan, which actually did bomb and would have if it could have invaded. Australia in uh, World <laughs> War II. And uh, there are some people still alive uh, who were bombed in Darwin by the Japanese Air Force. Now they want you to link up with Japan and, uh, and fight China, which was similarly invaded. And of course, it's people massacred by that very same Japan. It's a very ugly alliance, isn't it? It is indeed, uh, especially considering uh, the uh, evolution of uh, of, the, uh, of the Japanese, uh, say, foreign policy, and particularly its policy towards uh, militarization, or should I say, re-militarization, and uh, once again uh, allowing allowing for uh, say the use of the use of the, of the military for uh, not just not just for self-defense purposes, something that was previously defined in the constitution in the post-war. Uh, constitution of of Japan. There, uh, with regards to the Australia, the Australian Japanese military cooperation uh, against uh, China, I believe this is also this really is also a, a, a symptom of the um, of the of the uh, uh, of the paradox that Australia finds it, finds itself in uh, of effect of. Australia being being forced to go against its uh, commercial and economic uh, economic interests uh, with with its many years of uh, of, uh, of trade deals uh, with China, Australia Australia effectively being being forced uh, into uh, cooperation military military cooperation uh, with a, with a nation that you said previously invaded them, and Australia effectively being being forced to do the dirty work of the. Uh, <clears throat> uh, of the Western of the Western imperialist uh, nations, namely the United States and the uh, and the United and the United Kingdom, what what I feel like what, what we're really seeing here is the loss of the Australian sovereignty. Uh, there's the ability of Australia to do you know implement its own sovereign uh, decisions uh, with regards to uh, with regard uh, you know with, with, with regards with regards to the economy with regards to uh, uh, any of the uh, any, any potential alliances that could greatly uh, benefit it. I personally believe that uh, Australia would uh, greatly benefit uh, from from being a member of BRICS, from being an associate member of the African uh, Union, from being an associate member or an observer or an observer member of the Community of Latin American uh, Nations, and strengthening really strengthening its position among the non-aligned wor- non-aligned world. Uh, and, and when you look at the numbers, uh, the trade uh, the, the numbers, commercial numbers, uh, and trading uh, of Australia with the with the rest of the world, you can clearly see it, uh, you know, drawing closer and closer uh, to the major powers like China, like India, and before the uh, before before the conflict in Ukraine, also uh, with uh, also with Russia. So. Uh, there what's, is, their, there is what's their take potential. on? Uh, yeah, what, what, what's their take? Just finally, Dennis, what's their take on the Russia-Ukraine uh, conflict? They're obviously being encouraged to preoccupy themselves with uh, preparing for war with China, 
as I have seen in headlines in the Australian media, absurd though it sounds, this Lilliputian, they'll not even have these submarines until you're a very old man, although you'll be paying for them uh, throughout your working life. Uh, the, the Lilliputian is being pointed at China, but are they equally hawkish against Russia? Australia has, has certainly joined in with this, uh, with, with, with what I would say, the uh, uh, the anti-Russia coalition, along with uh, practically practically all the rest of the uh, Western world. Uh, Australia has also uh, has also sent uh, five hundred million dollars worth of uh, lethal aid uh, to Ukraine, and with you know with weapon with weapons and um, uh, weapons, ammunition and uh, other other items, including the uh, Bushmaker uh, armored, armored personnel carriers uh, that have, that were previously del- delivered uh, to Ukraine. Yeah, Australia has also agreed to uh, tr- uh, to begin training of the uh, of the Ukrainian uh, troops in what's well, both both in Australia and there are also there are also Australian military advisors uh, which are sta- which are stationed uh, in U- in Ukraine. So I'd say once again, once again, Australia, uh, you know, sort of sleep sleepwalking into uh, another conflict uh, in the world, in a, another conflict in which Australian sovereignty and the Australian independence were never uh, were never under threat, where the where the uh, the the Australia's you know economic interests were never under threat, and yet it's you know the will of the Australian government. Uh, was such that uh, there was such that they believe that you know the alliance uh, with the United States is definitely is is worth uh, much uh, much more uh, than uh, any potential for the. Well, Australia, I'll tell you what. Uh, I'll tell you know. what, Dennis. Uh, we've we've lo- we've run out of time, but I'll tell you what. Given how much they are doing for the British and the American arms industry and the geopolitical stances of the United States and the UK, you'd think that they'd be able at least to get your compatriot Julian Assange sprung from a British dungeon and sent home to see his family there. Dennis, thank you very much indeed for joining us on the mother of all talk shows from uh, Latin America. Who will be the first to fall? A. Macron, B. Netanyahu, C. Sunak. Uh, now, let's uh, take some calls. Uh, Imogen is in Cheltenham on the American shooting. I don't know which one. I would say the latest one, but it might not be the latest one by now. Imogen, what would you like to say? Oh, hello. Well, firstly, thank you very much, George, for having me on. And um, I'd like to say hello to all the Motis, which are your viewers and listeners. Um, so, okay. yes, I wanted to thank talk about... Thank you very much. I didn't know that. Um, I wanted to talk about the Tennessee school shooting. Um, And the reason I wanted to talk about it is because, A, you mentioned it, and, B, um, there's something that people seem to be missing in in the dialogue. Um, The fact is that I'm not... And I'm... Firstly, I have great sympathy for all of those who have lost people, to all those families, you know, my heart goes out to them. Um... Now, the, the person who did the, the shooting was apparently um, somebody, it was a woman who was taking hormones to become a man or something. And um, yes. so that hormone would be testosterone. Now, I have personal knowledge of testosterone because um, I'm a woman. I was born a woman. I'm going to be a woman until the end of my days. Um, and, you know, I've not interested in changing at all but I had cancer and um, the cancer I had which I'm cured of by the way now um, was an estrogen sensitive cancer so yeah thank god and um, so in order to prevent um, because it because it destroyed my hormones uh, well my sex hormones um, so in order to prevent osteoporosis Alzheimer's and um, heart disease um, i I took uh, testosterone, a small amount of testosterone, um, to to prevent those illnesses, a woman's amount. And 
I can say, honestly, that the small amount of testosterone I had, even though it was a woman's amount, had a big effect on um, on my behavior and, you know, and on my muscle strength and things like that. And that was just a woman's amount. I can't imagine how difficult it must be for somebody who's taking a massive amount of hormones. And, and I just think we should all stop messing around with these hormones. That's what I wanted to say. Well, I think that's, uh, I think that's a very powerful call uh, that many people will think about uh, for quite some time. Uh, I can't really comment on the medical scientific uh, side of it, except to say that yours is personal testimony and it should be listened to and should be paid heed to. It seems obvious uh, that, uh, you know, if you, if you injected me with the uh, horse serum, uh, I, I'd be stronger, perhaps faster, maybe more aggressive than if you hadn't injected me with it. And if someone is taking a course of uh, testosterone as well as other treatments involved, no doubt, in the transitioning, from female to male, uh, the fact that that might make uh, that person unbalanced, uh, indeed insane and insanely aggressive uh, with the physical power to make good on that aggression uh, sounds as good a hypothesis as I've heard from anyone else in this terrible, terrible story. So Imogen, thank you for bravely uh, phoning and making those points. Uh, brave man in Glasgow next. It's the one and only, the legend, Tommy. Go on yourself, Tom. Assalamu alaikum, my dearest brother. How are you doing? By the grace of God, good. What would you like to talk about? Uh, I'd like to give some information out there that quite a lot of people would be interested. Maybe a lot of people don't know. Uh, first of all, I did have a dealing with him a way back when he was a host for a radio station called Radio Ramadan. Uh, I called him a, a chumcher, which uh, he has turned out well to be, which is a silly little uh, dumpling. But anyway, he is uh, the son of a Mr. Yusuf, who is an accountant, or was the accountant for uh, the, 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 the first minister, the previous one, Nicola, old Nippy Sweetie. Uh, so we can see a bit of oh. nepotism there. I don't know if you were aware of that, that uh, old, old uh, Mr. Yusuf. I was father, not, was no. And uh, her, her, accounts, uh, her accounts might come under some scrutiny along with her husband's uh, accounts by the police indeed. and indeed the Crown Office that now have and a so report the well should. Uh, from the police. Yeah. So the well should, yeah. And also his uncle Bashir Mann, who was an SNP councillor. Uh, and when I spoke to him a way back then, he was introducing, as a side note, maybe old G.I. Joe, the Presidente or the CIA might well take note that while he was introducing uh, a, a, a sheikh called Amr Alaki, who was killed it was an American Yemeni who was held to be the top or second top after Mr. Bin Laden and Al Zawiri or whoever it was, but Mr. Amr Alaki was uh, in Glasgow at the time as well for a, 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 a speech and they recorded it in their infinite wisdom. It was heaven and hell lectures and your now first minister was there. I heard it with my own ears because I was sitting there listening to it. He was introducing the great sheikh, as he called him, uh, Amar Alaki, uh, and his heaven and hell lectures. As I say, this is the sheikh who was killed by the CIA drone. Well, uh, so this is the new first leader. Well, I'll tell you what, uh, Tommy... Yeah. Tom, yeah, no, don't go any further for a minute. That is, as breaking news goes, possibly the biggest piece of breaking news that has ever broken on this show. Uh, if, uh, if your memory is correct, if Hamza Youssef did indeed invite to Glasgow and introduce as the great sheikh uh, this man who was killed by an American drone attack, as an alleged leader of Al-Qaeda in the peninsula, 
That is very, very big news. Are you absolutely sure about it, Tom? Well, well in, in a sense, George, I'll clarify it. He introduced on the radio what they did. He was at a talk in Glasgow, and they recorded these Heaven and Hell lectures. And then over the period of the few weeks of Ramadan, they, and, uh, and they, they, it was on for a, a year later as well, she, uh, Mr. Humza Yusuf uh, was introducing on the radio, listen to the, the Heaven and Hell lectures by Amar al -Laki. And this was 15 wow. years ago, 17, 20 years ago, while he was still a student. And at the time when he was saying, oh, I'm going to be an MSP, I'm going to be part of the SNP, I was on there calling him a chump, just saying, listen, it will do no good for you. You will do no good. They will, you will end up becoming a, an MP or an MSP and it will corrupt you. And as you said earlier on, my dearest brother, when you said earlier on how he's become woke, how he convert, how he came out with those lies, how he said, uh, and even, even even Alex Salmon said, oh, this was untrue, where he turned around and said, oh, I had to go make a call. I didn't vote at the time to try and save his conscience. As one of my good brothers says, he's a sellout, he's a washout. Because it, 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 for him to then turn around and say, you know, that he would have voted for the, 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 the gay marriages, what part of Islam, I mean, for myself, I care not a jot what someone does with between themselves. It's up to them. It's between their God if they don't believe it or not. For me, I'm not that way inclined. Never have been. I love the female form. That's just my take on it. But the fact is, he is now presiding over a whole country where he's a hypocrite. If he goes between his God and says he's a Muslim and he says, oh, and he prays and he does what he's supposed to, then he's well out the fold of Islam. It's not for me to comment on that, really. But for him to then sit there as, as a first minister and say, oh, he, he, he's all for same-sex marriage, you're cutting the torches off the, the, the youngs. I mean, for me, that's been a failure. And they're teaching kids in school. You know, he's all for this. He's in love with the SNP. As far as I'm concerned, he's a washout. He's a disgrace uh, for, for what he represents. And as I say, George, I'm 100% sure that when he was on the radio for Ramadan, Radio Ramadan, a way back when he was a student, he was introduced, introducing this sheikh uh, for the Heaven and Hell lecture at the time. And for me, as I say, I wow. mean, now he, he's jumped he's jumped 20 years down the line and it's corrupted them. Power corrupts absolutely, and absolute power corrupts. Now he's sitting at the top of the tree. I, I'm, I'm, I'm now going for the next post of being the next King of Scotland, George, because if this half-witted idiot can rise to such a station... Uh, then I'm, I'm going, as I say, I'm, I want to be the next King of Scotland, George, because there's, there's a gap in the market, because when there's dumplings, when there's half-wit idiots who have no brains, who are no marks, who I, I rode them like a donkey on that radio, told them what he was, gave him his character on his cars and said, you know what, if you go down this road and look where it's led them, well, it's led to First Minister, but he's a dumpling, he's a failed First Minister, he's a failed ex-secretary and all these posts, he's failed, as you said, and God help us, George. But like you said a few weeks ago, it would be God good help us, uh, indeed. Uh, help. Will it be heaven or will it be hell? Tommy, I'm in Glasgow on Monday, uh, 7 o'clock. Glasgow Green were meeting. Uh, we'll not be having the meeting outdoors, but we're gathering at Glasgow Green, going to uh -huh. a nearby uh, venue. Uh, we have to keep that under wraps because uh, just like happened in London, uh, these great okay. Democrats have hunted uh, 7 o'clock on Monday evening at Glasgow Green at the usual God well meeting and place. God well and I hope to the see you. I hope to, to see you, you then. Take to care, brother. You. All the best. God bless you. Brian is in British Columbia on Haiti. Let's hear from Brian. Go ahead, Brian. Hi, George. I just want to say uh, thank you very much for taking my call. Last week, uh, uh, your uh, show on Big Ben to Iraq blew my mind. That was uh, admirable. Um, so my okay. question is, uh, I watch uh, our local uh, C-SPAN, uh, CPAC every week, you know, um, as much as I can. And... Uh, this visit Joe Biden came to Canada last week. They're trying to, the liberals are trying to tell the country that it's basically, uh, you know, about uh, free trade agreements and, you know, this and that, and which, which is a lie. I mean, Joe Biden came here to basically try to get our country to invade, to do the, our United States dirty work 
to invade Haiti. And I want to know if you think that's actually going to happen. Have you heard about that? Uh, uh, of course. Uh, and I'm certain that the United States want uh, Canada to do the dirty work in Haiti, just like, as we just heard, they are engaging Australia to do the dirty work against China. Uh, they'll fight to the last drop of uh, the last uh, Canadian's blood. They'll fight to the last drop of the last Ukrainian's blood. Ditto Australian. Anybody's blood but their own if they can help it. And uh, having disastrously invaded and occupied Haiti so many times before, it seems clear that they are intent on doing so again. And the proximate reason is the state of lawlessness which exists following the murder of the elected president who was murdered by American and Colombian mercenaries in his own bedroom. And if you don't believe that the United States was involved in that murder, then I've got a bridge here in London that I could sell you or anyone else going cheap. Brian, last word to you, sir. I was just going to say, just like uh, they're not involved in, you know, the blowing up of the pipeline, right? I mean, everybody that follows exactly. you or, or anybody else knows the truth. And um, it blows my mind that I, I truly believe maybe 5% of the world is awake to what is going on. You know, there's uh, 4% of them are puppets and 90% uh, are sleep and 1% rule the world. No, That's but I'll tell you what, say. Brian, we, we have to, we ha no, Brian, we have to shake ourselves from this. The vast majority of the world is awake. What you're really describing is our world, yours and mine, the bubble, the Anglosphere. And I don't believe it's as low as 5%, but you're right. The great majority are asleep or they are sheep, and it only takes a few sheepdogs to... Uh, herd them even onto the uh, truck for their final journey. That's true. But we are a tiny proportion of the world, Brian. We are, in total, 13% of the world's population, and many of that 13% profoundly disagree with what our rulers are doing to us and to the rest of the world. So, it's way less than 13%. That means the rest, the people of Africa, people of Asia. I spoke on a platform with the, the leader of the Socialist Party of Zambia uh, just the other day, crystal clear. And according to him, and I believe him, nobody in Zambia, nobody is doing anything other than laugh or cry at the idea that the U.S. chose Lusaka in Zambia to hold a conference on democracy, of all places, to hold a conference on democracy. They chose Southern Africa. Let's take a last call before the break. Uh, our Thank good you, friend sir. and sage in New York, Erebos in New York. Go ahead, Erebos. Greetings and salutations, Mr. Galloway. And of course, uh, much love and to you. you your family and your loved ones and supporters. Uh, I, I do have to say the um, the Bristol, what was it, Britain to Baghdad or Bristol to Baghdad, I, I cried three, three quarters of the way, at least 75% of it. Um, I, I couldn't even wow. watch it twice. I have it, I have it in my tab, but it, it, uh, it affected me in many, many ways. And, um, you know, I'm glad that I've seen it and the restoration technology that went to making it possible for us to see it. I think it's world historic and needs to be seen. And I hope the bus is in the British Museum at least. So I, I, had, I just wanted to... I'm um, afraid it was I destroyed in the war, uh, brother, but uh, I'm very touched and moved by your uh, comments. Uh, the bus was in a historic place in Baghdad uh, from when we left it there in 1999 until the US-UK invasion of Iraq, the shock and all, uh, whereupon it was destroyed, I'm sorry to say. So these pictures that you've seen of it are the last remnants of it. 
but it will be forever in my eyes, in my memory and in my heart. Indeed, its legacy and what it was able to do despite the travails shall endure and must endure. Uh, the second thing I want to say real, real briefly, a little humorously, is um, I was trying for the past month to get through. And, um, but I, I would say that it was, I, it was an honor for me to make way for the legend in Bristol, Norma, right? <laughs> it, was, it was an honor for me to make way for her. Um, so I was glad for that. Okay. Um, but what I want to touch on today, very briefly, because I know time is always against us, um, the 39 people that died in a fire in a swear that, uh, Ciudad Juarez in Mexico. Um, this, this is a, uh, this is the results of the Trump Biden policy, right? Um, the, there's a, uh, an ongoing cultural war fiction that, you know, we have open borders and you hear that a lot. And that's more of a reactionary throwing meat to the cultural base type thing. In reality, Biden has deported over 4 million people. Uh, last number I saw um, on uh, United We Dream using the uh, Border Patrol and ICE data, uh, it's, it's 4,071,000 and change, right? That's historic. That's even more than his boss, Obama, in the first two years. And this is important to understand, right, that uh, Obama is not a lib I mean, not Obama. Uh, Biden is, there's nothing uh, progressive or liberal about him. He's a super reactionary, neocon, racist legacy. But the, the reason why this is happening, the issue at the border, this started with the 1996 immigration law by Bill Clinton and Newt Gingrich. And what that has done is created a situation where people, uh, when they go in front of a judge, they present themselves in front of a judge for asylum or to be deported and whatnot. The judge and the attorney general had discretion to let people out or not, or put them on some sort of conditional release. The judge has no more uh, discretion, so which means they created a backlog of people who cannot be processed, people who've been demoralized and destroyed by U.S. policy in Honduras, Mexico, uh, Guatemala, and these countries. You know, and that's important to understand. So I'll just finish by saying Title VIII and Title 42. Title VIII is uh, the policy where you get a catch and release, like they, they, they snatch someone up who presents themselves or who does not present themselves, and then they deport them right away. And Title 42 is the policy that Trump started at saying anybody who has COVID, they can't enter, and all these people have COVID. And so he, he, he pressured Mexico, uh, Almo down there, to create this situation of migrant facilities, and they have to stay in their country until they are called. And this created the strategy this tragedy. Um, and I know I said it was the last thing, but this is vitally important. In the 90s in New Jersey, Cubans were stuck in the INS center when it was INS back then, and now it's ICE. They were stuck in a facility, uh, lifetime detention. They call it indefinite detention, which is basically a life sentence. And they were in New Jersey, and they took the guards hostage, and they had them on TV because they were Cubans. They could not be deported, and they did not want to release them. And so they created, and they took the guards hostage, and they put them on TV, and they said, we are ready to exchange our lives in order for our freedom. We're only being punished because we're Cuban. We did our time. We paid our debt to society. And now you have people locked in here indefinitely, which is unconstitutional. But we're willing to take these guards out so you can see how serious we are. They're creating this type of situation again. Only thing it's not happening in the, in the country, it's happening in the border of Mexico. So people need context about this immigration reality. And uh, the callers so far have been brilliant. I appreciate you, George, and uh, love, peace, and hair grease. God bless you. What a wonderful, wonderful call. I'm officially designating you a legend. So you are now on our priority list. Coming up after the break, it's the one and only. Who in a sane world would be in the White House, either as the president or perhaps as the secretary of state? The Pulitzer Prize winner, American journalist Chris Hedges. Don't miss him. He's here right after the break. 
You are listening to the Mother of All Talk Shows podcast with George Galloway. Well, almost 19,000 people now have voted. Who will be the first to fall? Macron, 59%. Netanyahu, 27%. Rishi Sunak, 14%. Uh, that's on uh, Twitter. On YouTube, Macron 66, Netanyahu 22, Sunak 12. On Telegram, Macron 61, Netanyahu 25, Sunak 14. And on the YouTube community poll, where 14,000 people have voted, it's Macron 59, Netanyahu 22, Sunak 19. Very, very interesting. You can still vote for the remainder of the show on any of these portals. Um, I happen to think it will be Netanyahu that is the first to fall because I think the United States has instigated a regime change operation against them. Who better to test that thesis on than the former head of the New York Times Middle East Bureau, the one and only wonderful Chris Hedges. Chris, as always, welcome to the mother of all talk shows. What, what about my, uh, my thesis there? Uh, this, uh, these events in uh, Israel have all the hallmarks, to me, uh, of the U.S. Uh, deciding to get rid of Netanyahu. Do you see it that way? Yeah. I, I, uh, I mean, first of all, his coalition is very fragile to begin with, uh, and he has alienated the mainstream Jewish groups in the United States who have tremendous political power. I encourage everybody to watch that wonderful Al Jazeera documentary, The Lobby, uh, which was never actually broadcast on Al Jazeera because the Israel lobby intervened to essentially get it removed from the airwaves, but there are pirated copies on Electronic Intifada everywhere else. So uh, this has created a problem, uh, a kind of public relations problem for uh, the, the Israel lobby in the United States, as well as fervent Israel backers like Joe Biden, who describes himself as a Zionist. Of course, as you know well, George, uh, the, the major part of the equation, and I would argue one of the reasons Israel or Israeli society has devolved into this uh, kind of competing uh, authoritarianism between uh, secular figures like Netanyahu and hard right religious zealots is the occupation. Uh, and we can laud uh, Israelis for clogging the streets of Tel Aviv, uh, but that Palestinian issue, which I think is really the root cause of uh, the deformation of Israeli society, is never brought up. Uh, and of course, the ability to continue funding. Uh, the Israeli military, to the, I think they get about $3 billion a year in aid. Uh, the obsequious, uh, essentially, acceptance by the State Department and the Biden administration of just about everything Israel does uh, uh, is very hard to continue, given the uh, kind of coloring of the net, the clear corruption of the Netanyahu government, uh, which is essentially destroying or ripping down the firewalls between the judiciary uh, and uh, and the executive branch, or, or you know the prime minister's office, uh, so that he can save himself from being indicted for corruption charges. I think he has three cases brought against him. We see a lot uh, on television of the demonstrations in Israel. We see nothing on television of the very very much larger demonstrations in France which tells me that the, the prevailing orthodoxy approves of the demonstrations in Tel Aviv and disapproves of the demonstrations in France. Um, the alliance between the United States and its European NATO partners is beginning to look a little less secure, isn't it? Uh, the government of France may very well fall. Uh, if Macron doesn't fall... He will certainly have to abandon key parts of his program uh, in government and will not easily be able to write any more big checks for Ukraine. Uh, do you think the U.S. oligarchy will be nervous about just how secure 
their allies now are in power in Europe. Yes, although, of course, they are one of the engines for the political, social, and economic problems that are besetting countries like the UK, Germany, and France. Uh, it, it's Europe that's paying the price for the Ukraine war. I mean, especially Germany, in terms of the skyrocketing energy costs, the destruction of the Nord Stream pipeline, uh, which may have served uh, US geopolitical interests, but was a devastating blow to the German economy. So uh, this is all created really out of Washington or NATO, which is a, just a puppet of Washington. Uh, and, and yes, they have essentially orchestrated events around Ukraine uh, that weaken and undermine the, the very allies that they rely on. So yeah, I think that's an astute point. Uh, and, and they're nervous whether they un understand or whether they, I, I don't see them retracting from this uh, infusion of, I mean, we've committed, the United States has committed $113 billion in military and humanitarian assistance to Ukraine. That's almost twice the budget of the State Department, which is $60 billion a year. I think it's more than the military budget of Russia, if I have that right. It is indeed more than the total military budget, budget of Russia. Now, the uh, latest out of Kiev, uh, from Zelensky talking to an American newspaper is that if he loses Bakhmut, he may have to compromise uh, with Russia. Uh, we don't know if that's a bluff to get some last minute uh, cavalry coming over the hill uh, to Bakhmut. But if he means it, it could be very significant because I study the war map very closely. I know you do too. Uh, Bakhmut is uh, now a tiny uh, square, few square kilometers of industrial plant uh, in the center of the city. The rest has been taken uh, by the Russian forces and by the Wagner PMC forces. And uh, there's actually no way out now for the Ukrainians left there. And many of them have already been withdrawn. So if Bakhmut's about to fall, and Zelensky is right that if it falls, he has to compromise. What might that look like? What do you think kinetically would happen after that? Well, from a distance, I think Bakhmut is important. Remember, it was originally before the Russians, essentially, as you correctly point out, uh, were able to occupy it. It was uh, trumpeted as a major center and the Ukrainians were lifted up now, in, at least in the U.S. media, it's, being dismissed as just a small town, but it's a major communications hub uh, and uh, it opens up roads and rail lines to uh, the Russian forces. Uh, Lloyd Austin, I think, said in January that time was running out. These are his words for the Ukrainians. That's why they've thrown all this sophisticated military hardware at Ukraine. It's kind of a desperate Hail Mary. Uh, I was in the last tank battle uh, with M1 Abrams in the war in Iraq. Those are extremely difficult uh, machines to operate. They require constant support teams, uh, and they're also very unforgiving. Any kind of mistake with a, in an M1 Abrams can be lethal, uh, and then you don't have a adequate air cover in and of itself. So I, I think even the NATO officials know that some of the equipment, and in particular these kinds of tanks, are not going to turn the tide of the battle. I'm not sure whether it's uh, just essentially a, a kind of propaganda ploy. Uh, well, the U.S. has adamantly blocked any kind of negotiations because the goal of the United States has, has nothing to do with Ukraine. It has to do with degrading the Russian military and weakening Vladimir Putin's hold on power. So ultimately, uh, as the New York Times wrote a few months ago in an editorial, uh, which is, of course, it's a very pro, taken a very pro-war stance, but even the paper realized that there would have to be negotiations, there would have to be a, a, a kind of exchange of land for peace. I think the U.S. planners know that, uh, but they, are, they want to keep this conflict going as long as they can to punish Russia as much as they can, uh, even if the ultimate conclusion, which they must know, is exactly what the New York Times said, some kind of negotiated settlement. Remember, they have blocked, there was an effort by Turkey Early on, the U.S. stepped in to block it. Uh, when China made noises recently about negotiated settlement, uh, it was shot down by 
uh, Blinken and the State Department. Uh, no, they, they, it's, I covered many proxy wars in my 20 years overseas. Uh, there are many ways that uh, imperial powers have to project power, but proxy wars are probably the most cynical because they destroy the peoples and the countries they're purporting to uh, protect. And that's exactly what's happening in Ukraine. So you will see hostility. They, 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 they don't care if half the electrical system is out. They don't care how many Ukrainians, kids, and now they're recruiting, I think, kids and men up to 60. Uh, they don't care. I mean, that, that, that their geopolitical goals are very cynical. And in the end, they're quite happy. This happened in all sorts of proxy wars I covered, including with the Kurds. They're quite happy to sell these people out when it serves their interests. And that's what we're seeing. Sure. Uh, of course, I take all those points. Uh, that is the uh, way the empire behaves, any empire. But from the point of view of Zelensky, and if not he, then he who comes after him, because uh, if the objective reality is that after Bakhmut, they're beat, and that's essentially what is now being said in the military blogs and so on, for the reasons you adumbrated, uh, if it's Bakhmut, then we're beat. Then if you don't make a deal, you lose absolutely everything. The Russians take absolutely everything. Now, that might not trouble the US. It might not even trouble Zelensky. He has bolt holes to flee to. But somebody will come to power in Kiev, either by coup or some other means, that will want to make a deal uh, with Russia to preserve something of the sovereignty of their country, even if just the West of it. So we have a potential clash of interests, don't we, between, uh, between Kiev and Washington? Yeah, that's often true in proxy wars, uh, that, that the interests of the proxy diverge from the interests of the sponsor. Uh, but the sponsor will put very heavy pressure. And of course, uh, uh, Ukraine is on life support from the IMF, uh, from uh, uh, NATO weaponry. Without that steady flow of both uh, financial assistance, because the Ukrainian economy has collapsed, and military assistance, they can't prosecute the war. So that's a very powerful lever uh, that they have to hold over the heads of Zelensky or anyone else. And I can tell you, again, having covered all sorts of proxy wars uh, they, uh, the, the, you know, as Henry Kissinger famously said when he was called out for abandoning the Kurds, uh, which were then crushed uh, uh, in, the, in an ethnic cleansing campaign in northern Iraq, uh, he said, uh, you know, covert action is not missionary work. Uh, I, I cover these people for many years. They, they don't care. Uh, that they, they, uh, they will sacrifice Ukraine and Ukrainians for their interests until the last Ukrainian. And they have a lot of power to prohibit. And they already have blocked, as far as I can tell, two, certainly one very serious negotiated proposal out of Turkey. I don't know how serious the Chinese one was, but it was raised. Uh, and the reaction was vociferous out of Washington uh, that there would be no negotiation. So uh, you, you are going to have this classic case where uh, at a certain point, uh, when it becomes, I think, as you point out correctly, inevitable that Russia is going to roll over uh, the Ukrainians, that they are going to want to salvage what they can. Uh, but again, I reiterate, this is for the U.S. It has nothing to do with Ukraine. It has everything to do with Moscow. And, and severing Moscow and Putin from Europe, that's always been a long-term goal of the U.S. empire. And that, of course, uh, they've largely achieved. And, and in that sense, the Ukrainian proxy war has been quite successful. Trump says he could end the war in 24 hours. Is that kind of anti-war talk by Trump having any traction in the U.S.? It doesn't seem to on Capitol Hill, uh, but is no. it amongst the Republican base got any traction? Yes, some people are getting, I mean, the, the we are not suffering the way you're suffering in the U.K. in terms of inflation and economic degradation. However, we are suffering from inflation and a decline in real wages. And uh, so there is growing a growing restiveness about the endless amounts of money that are being pumped into Ukraine and questions as to why those kinds of resources are not provided to uh, citizens in the United States. I mean, we just had another mass shooting where the country is being ripped apart. 
uh, trail de train derailments that are spilling chemical uh, weapons, uh, uh, the, the, the protections against the rising health care costs are going to be lifted or at least a expansion of Medicare uh, within the I mean, those things are getting worse and worse here for the working class and working poor. And, and, and they're asking precisely those questions. And that has made the establishment nervous. Remember, the establishment Republican Party and the establishment Democratic Party, which is now fused into one party, really one oligarchic corporate entity. They always were. Uh, and that's where you get the Democratic Party, in essence, adopting figures like Liz Cheney or Mitt Romney or uh, pun right wing pundits like uh, Crystal and others. Uh, and uh, uh, they are nervous. Uh, they are nervous. Uh, could Trump end it in a day? Well, you know, Trump has a habit of, uh, you know, kind of uh, uh, boasting of all sorts of things that can happen in a day that he can't do. However, I think within the zeitgeist, there is a weariness, clearly a weariness on this endless infusion of staggering sums of resources and money into Ukraine. And of course, they're about to see, once again, like the 20 year fiascos in the Middle East, uh, that they're not going to get what supposedly they paid for. Now, finally, this is almost a philosophical question, but you are uh, definitely the most erudite man I'm going to speak to today or any day. Uh, I'm puzzled about this democracy forum that the U.S. is holding of all places in Southern Africa. I made a point at the beginning of the show about the U.S.'s role in Southern Africa, which I knew very well, as you did too, uh, of, uh, uh, of the fact that it's so blatantly aimed at others rather than for democracy in Africa. It's really aimed against China, an obsession against China, to a lesser extent against Russia. I was making the point, uh, you could sum it all up in one photo caption. Us killing Patrice Lumumba and Moscow having a Patrice Lumumba International University, uh, which I've spoken many times in, uh, in Russia. Uh, the difference between the big powers in relation to Africa, so disadvantageous for the United States, you wonder why they bothered holding it in Lusaka. Well, they're kind of tone deaf. Uh, let's begin there. Uh, I, they've largely walked away. So, you know, I, I worked in places like the Congo and the Sudan, uh, and uh, we withdrew most of our, we kind of checked out of Africa, really. Uh, and the Chinese have filled that void. Uh, and it's interesting that they filled it not uh, militarily, but in terms of technical assistance and uh, building infrastructure and, uh, you know, what's commonly referred to as soft power. And they've been quite effective. Uh, and of course, Africa is a very resource rich continent. So that's what you're seeing. You're seeing a kind of very ham fisted, tone deaf attempt on the part of Washington uh, to counter. It's a little late now. Counter. Uh, essentially the, the loss of uh, influence and control uh, that they once had in Africa. Uh, and yes, of course, that, that uh, included uh, all sorts of CIA operations. Uh, I guess, I think, wasn't it the French intelligence who finally actually killed uh, uh, Lumumba, but that was a coordinated effort by French imperialists and American imperialists. Uh, but it, it is another sort of uh, uh, knee-jerk response or desperate grab uh, towards a, a regaining a lost hegemony that's already gone. Uh, and, uh, and, and the worse things get, the more isolated and the more, or, and the weaker, in essence, uh, in this multipolar world that the United States becomes, the, the more uh, kind of uh, frantic uh, the efforts to regain that lost hegemony will be, we're already seeing that with the military posturing in terms of China, Taiwan, Nancy Pelosi going to Taiwan, all this kind of stuff. Uh, and that's, that, that is a feature of late empire, what historians call micro-militarism. The Athenians did it when they invaded Sicily and their whole fleet was sunk. Uh, and then the empire fragmented. Uh, and then of course the assault on the dollar will be the death blow uh, because once the dollar is no longer the world's reserve currency and we're seeing a steady uh, retraction or moving away by countries 
uh, from the dollar uh, then uh, the collapse of the dollar like the pound sterling in the 1950s uh, will essentially make the, the make it impossible to sell treasury bonds nobody will buy our debt and we, we and we fund our empire largely through debt so all of those 750 military bases we have around uh, the world will have to be uh, shut down uh, it, it will have a, a devastating effect on the American economy so we're seeing the last days of empire and in the last days of empire, there are often these, uh, you know, desperate, I would call it, attempts uh, to regain what has been lost forever. And that, that, I think, really kind of sums up what we're seeing in Africa. A time of monsters. You're a scholar and a gentleman, as always. Chris Hedges, thanks for joining us on the mother of all talk shows. Who will be the first to fall? Will it be Macron, Netanyahu or Sunak? Uh, you can vote. I think 20,000 people have now voted. Probably got about 10 minutes to get your vote in on Twitter, on YouTube, on Telegram or on the YouTube community poll. Some beautiful uh, mail on my Patreon. Uh, your document this is from Daniela Modas Kutter, who is a regular supporter of the show. I wanted to say your documentary tonight was so powerful it brought me to tears. And John Ryrie uh, is, has been listening to my audio book on the 1970s. And he says, I really enjoyed the first 13 chapters of your 70s memoir. They were great days in the Labour Party. Indeed, ancient history. But thanks for reading or listening, rather. Uh, from one Scotsman then to another. This is Malcolm in Glasgow. Malcolm, welcome. Hi, George. I'm watching you on, ca uh, on Catch Up, and you're looking dapper tonight. Uh, uh, George, you. I'd just like to say a couple of things about um, Hamza Useless uh, with regard to him being First Minister of Scotland. And I don't know if your international mm. viewers are, are aware, but one of his speeches recently in Scotland was when Scotland's 95% white, whether that's good or bad, I don't know, and I'm not a judge of that. But he stood up in Parliament and he said, the chief of police, white, the judges, white, the fire chief, white, the national, you know, the SM, you know, whatever, white, 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 white. And it was quite an aggressive statement he used. And that's, very like aggressive. Very. Very aggressive. But I'd like to, I'd like to counter that to uh, George, because as a proud Scotsman, and as a proud, you know, person that welcomes all comers, if I was to say the mayor of London, black, the mayor of Birmingham, black, the mayor of Leeds, black. The mayor of Blackburn, black. The mayor of Sheffield, black. The mayor... Now, my point is, George, I congratulate these individuals for being the mayors of their countries. And I'm proud to be Scottish. I'm proud to be British. And here we have the first minister of Scotland uh, criticising 95% of his population for being white. I, I, I embrace diversity. I love diversity. And he is, uh, I don't want to use a, a strong language word on your channel, George, but I don't think he's no, don't, the best. No, don't, no, don't, no, don't, because I've, I've got the point, uh, Malcolm, and it's brilliantly, powerfully made. Incidentally, not only did the now First Minister uh, make that speech, a virtually identical speech was made by his now leader of the opposition, Anna Sarwa, the leader of the Labour Party. Both of them, uh, Pakistanis, both of them made virtually identical attacks on Scottish civil society for being too white, even though white people are, as you say, 95% of the population of the country. Me, I do my best to look as kind of nice bronze, brown uh, as I can, and I've, I've uh, fathered quite a few, five in fact, children that are not quite white. So I'm doing my best to solve the problem for Anas and Hamza. But the truth is, Scotland's the kind of country, because it's cold and miserable and not that many people really want to be there. They'd rather be somewhere else. They'd rather be in London, as most immigrants would like to be. Uh, it'll always be overwhelmingly white, which means that most of these positions 
apart from the chief minister of the country, of course, will likely be held by white people. Well, a kind of beefy red, like Alex Salmond. You know, white with the Aberdeen wind howling at you along the seafront. Thanks for that call. Uh, email from Tony tonight. Dear George, I have to ask you this, as you are both a football man and a politician. Would you sit on the government's proposed independent football regulator panel? Or do you think that the government should leave football to manage its own affairs best? Tony. Well, it depends which Tony you are, Tony. If you're Tony Blair and this is a trap, uh, I'm not going to answer you. And seriously, it uh, depends who asked me. Depends whose interests I would be being asked to represent. If it was to represent the football supporters or grassroots football, having three sons now fanatically, fully, totally engaged in grassroots boys football, and I'm shuttling across the country from one match to the other, uh, seeing them scoring goals, and in one case, quite regularly being sent off, uh, I, uh, and having to pay his fine, uh, I'm deeply interested in football at all levels. So it depends who asked and whose interests I would be being asked to represent. Uh, YouTube comments, Jay's philosophy. The US have spent the last 30 years dividing up the populace by race, gender, sexual identity, etc. So basically, it is the US that's on its last leg. And Dunk R says, remember Hamza? and his attempt to make offensive jokes said at home in private illegal? Do I? I live in terror sitting in my house in case someone's going to report my honest views in my own house to the government and I might be prosecuted by Hamza Youssef. Back to the Super Chats. Sean Bloor uh, sends 9.99. Looking flash in your new jacket, Georgie. Thank you, Sean. It cost me precisely... 19 pounds in a tailor up an alleyway in Beijing. I'm going to buy still more of them. JV Manila sends 275 pesos. Your Britain to Baghdad documentary moved me beyond words. You make your family and all of us proud. Thank you very much, JV. I'm very proud of it. It's been many years since I watched the film. It was virtually unwatchable until Chris James, the director, AI'd it and made it look so beautiful. And having now watched it again, uh, he even moved me and I was there. <laughs> I organized it. Uh, Brian Tremblay uh, sends five Canadian dollars. Uh, celebrate the first super chat from Brian Tremblay. I do, Brian. I celebrate it and thank you. Kevin Bill sends 10 pounds. I remember reading something about how all sides in occupied Europe came together to defeat the Nazis. It was the defining issue. We're in the same situation with the woke globalists now. There's brand new, unseen, hitherto unseen footage from China. Just gone up on my Patreon page right now, this evening. Uh, and, uh, and I hope that uh, my Patreon supporters will enjoy it. It was too big a file to send from Beijing in order to appear on moats on Sunday. So it's the bits that never arrived in England for the moats last Sunday are now on the Patreon page. Rob is in West Yorkshire. Let's hear from him about Jeremy Corbyn. Go ahead, Rob. Hi, George. Thanks for, for taking my call. Um, and thanks for sharing the film that you um, made in Iraq last week. Thank it was you. Really Seems to have gone down <laughs> well. Uh, I, had no, I had no idea it had gone down so well. I'm really gratified. Thanks, Rob. Well, that's okay. No, thanks for sharing it. Um, obviously, well, I'm assuming that most of your viewers um, are aware of the party NUPES in France, the coalition of the left that was formed by Jean-Luc Mélenchon. Mr. Mélenchon. Um, yeah, yeah, I'm kind of <laughs> living in hope that someone will form such a, a coalition in the UK. Um, and with the news of uh, Jeremy Corbyn, not being allowed to stand um, for Labour at the next general election. If he were to start um, a noop style coalition of the left or working class um, party, 
um, would you join? Um, I've also got a follow-up question. Sure, uh, he's the only one that can do it though, Rob. I mean, I, I am the leader of the Workers' Party of Britain. We will go on. We have our own uh, political stripe, uh, our own take on events, local and, and international, uh, that we will defend. But we are perfectly happy to be part of a wider, broader coalition. The only person that can create that coalition and lead it is Jeremy Corbyn. But he should have done it two years ago when he had hundreds of thousands of people that he could have marched out of the Labour Party at the head of. So he's left it very, very late. And of course, his hundreds of thousands have dwindled. There are still many thousands, uh, many scores of thousands, but they're no longer hundreds of thousands. And the momentum uh, was allowed to go. Momentum, if you'll forgive the pun, was allowed to just drain, dribble away. But uh, uh, better late than never. Uh, if he doesn't do it now, uh, when will he do it? If he doesn't do it now, what's the point of him? Uh, I think he should do it and he should announce that he's running for mayor of London against Sadiq Khan under that banner of this new coalition that he should lead and I'll uh, very happily be uh, in the background uh, of that. Uh, if that's what he's worried about or what anyone else is worried about. Uh, some worried that I might not be in it, some worried that I might be in it. So let me be clear, uh, I have no wish at all to lead such a coalition. That's his job and I would support him in any way that I could. Last word from you, Rob. Well, because sadly um, I don't think that Corbyn is going to do that. I've got a bad feeling in my gut that he's going to be um, Labour's Bernie Sanders rather than the people's Melanchon, if that makes sense. And I was going to ask you... It if does, you it's were a good, to, uh, good comparison. <clears throat> a I was going to ask you, if you were to join or form some sort of similar coalition, um, which parties or people would you want to see in it? Well, I, do, I don't think I'm capable of doing that. Uh, yeah. There's too much uh, bad blood uh, and uh, I would not be the right person to do that. On behalf of the Workers' Party and our uh, thousands of members, I can say that we will join any such coalition uh, created by, led by uh, Jeremy Corbyn. The problem is there are no Melanchons uh, yeah. out there in Britain uh, other than Jeremy Corbyn. I'm, I'm more Stalin than Melanchon, so that necessarily restricts my appeal. Uh, but it would mean that I would be much more effective if I was in charge. But the yeah. reality is only Corbyn has the breadth of appeal to be able to create such a coalition. Now, we've just had a fantastic phone call, apparently, from Ibrahim in Iraq, but our phone system won't let us call him back. Ibrahim, if you're watching... Call back and we'll try to get you on. Thank you, Ibrahim. Thank you, Gilbert, in Scotland, on China. Who's the next call? Go ahead, Gilbert. How you doing, How you doing mate? All good, sir. All good. Uh, what, what it was, George, uh, I, I, I watched a, an interesting uh, documentary the other night there. I think the bird's name was Laura Tingle. It was, she was talking to Paul Keaton. And it was regarding these yeah. uh, sub submarines. Now, yes. Keaton, Keaton told them apart. He he said the three hundred and sixty billion, I think, this uh, the amount of money involved was. He says gets them three submarines. He explained that the three submarines that they get, although they're nuclear submarines, they only fire torpedoes. They don't fire nuclear weapons. Uh, he said, no, not for now, no. There might be, they could be adapted though, Gilbert. I, I get that, but, but what he said, for, for the amount of money, he said these three submarines are no use, they're 80,000 tonnes each. Uh, he says, and run about Australia at shallow waters. 
He says they're visible all the time. Uh, but he said, I think it was, he said that they could get 40 or 45 normal submarines for that amount of money. He says, but uh, to protect their waters. But he said that the three, the only three submarines, these nu- nuclear ones that they're getting for America and Britain, is to sit on China's doorstep, <laughs> not no to protect yes. the rain waters. It's to sit there. That's right. Uh, and uh, and they'd be under the America and basically getting commanded by America and Britain or whoever. Exactly. Commanded by America. Absolutely correct, Gilbert. Uh, top call. And uh, let me apologise to the ornithological community. Gilbert did not actually mean birds. He meant something else. Ibrahim is in Iraq. Let's hear from him. Ibrahim, salam alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Alaikum salam. Oh, good. Nice to hear from you. Good, sir. Good, sir. Uh, you I, like just wanna, I just want to thank you. Like, uh, I have seen, uh, like, I'm a guy who likes history, and especially the history of my country. And uh, your name uh, has shown up during that research. And it was, to be honest, it was very honorable uh, uh, standing for me to like to stand with my country and with the, with the Iraqi people. So uh, I just want to thank you from my heart. Uh, I'm a guy who like lived all his life in Iraq and I'm still in Iraq here. Um, so thank you, thank you, sir. Lashukralo Wajib Ibrahim, your country entered my bloodstream. Uh, 30 years ago, really, and uh, we'll never leave it. And uh, you're always Mina Ayuni in my eyes. Thank you so much for your kind call. The poll is now closed. 21,342 people voted in it. Who will be the first to fall? On Twitter, Macron, 59, Netanyahu, 26, Sunak, 15. On YouTube, Macron, 64, Netanyahu, 22, Sunak 13 on Telegram, Macron 61, Netanyahu 25, Sunak 14. And on the YouTube community, Macron 59, Netanyahu 22, Sunak 19. I'm not sure if that's the biggest ever poll, but it's definitely up there. If it isn't, 21,342 people have voted. Now, from the middle of next month, Due to changes imposed by Twitter, uh, you, unless you are a paying member of Twitter, you'll not be able to vote on polls. So if you are a paying member or going to be on Twitter, you can still vote on our polls on Twitter. But if not, then you should get yourself on uh, Telegram or subscribe to my YouTube channel so you can vote uh, there. Uh, Super Chats now, Andrew Deppman, £10, thank you. Google search, unseen leader of the world, thank you for your passion, George. Thank you. Endof Dazi gives £5, thank you. Meg Gallucci, $9.99. Peter Moss, £5, simply inspiring, George, there's no other show like it. Here's my fiver. Thank you, Peter. And Mahmoud Merhadi sends two US dollars. In 1975, the U.S. did a coup in Australia. Indeed, I'm so old, I was there. Back to the lines, Brian, in Canada. On you go, Brian. George, let's end on a lighter note. Why don't you uh, put uh, okay. subtitles <laughs> under when you're, Sc- yeah, when you're Scottish callers call? <laughs> Cheers. <laughs> Which particular Scot did you find difficult? I mean, Malcolm well, I in Glasgow look, can, was surely, or, he, he was whole, pure I John can, Smith. He was perfect. I'm only quarter Scottish myself, but I can roll my arms for sure. Anyway, take care of my friend. All the best. <laughs> I don't even... Thank you very much. I think he means the legend, Big Tommy. Do you think? Let me know if you think you need subtitles under uh, Tommy. Alexander Lumsden gives £9.99. Thank you. Uh, Smack Tart. Gives 10 Australian dollars. 
Australia's Labour government was cooed by the US in 1975. Indeed, Gough Whitlam uh, was overthrown by the US uh, using the British uh, power of the Attorney General, not the Attorney General, the Governor General. Liam Ibrahim sends $2.79, $2.79 Canadian. Uh, the one and only Daniela Modas Cotta, £2.99, my comrade now. She's joined the Workers' Party and is heading up our disability page on our website. Roar Axdal sends 25 Norwegian crown. Robin Hunter sends one pound. Now some comments from the community, YouTube community. Amazing number of people watching and commenting on there. Monkey Boy says, the money could have been used to help raise Australian rugby and cricket from the pub team ranks to an international standard. Are they that bad? Bernadette says, when is George going to talk about how they are now taking 200 a month off people on pension credits? Well, call up Bernadette and tell us about it. I don't myself know about that. I can't be an expert on everything. Peter Martin said, 40 years ago, Scotland's education system was the envy of many a country. Indeed it was, Peter. I was a product of it myself. Alas, alas, no more. Chris is in Aberdeen. My goodness, the Scots are out tonight. Chris, welcome. Well, uh, thanks, George. Thanks for taking my call. Um, I just wanted to ask your opinion. I watched, uh, I forced myself to watch uh, a discussion between Bill Crystal and Anne Applebaum today. And in it, she made clear oh, that the, the US objective uh, should Russia win, which inevitably they will, was to expand Poland into the western part of Ukraine and continue on a guerrilla warfare against Russia, much as in the sort of Gladio-style NATO, NATO attacks of the 70s and 80s. I wonder what you think about that scenario. Well, uh, thank you, Chris. Uh, and there was definitely no need for subtitles on your wonderful Aberdonian diction. Uh, thank you for that. That'll probably be the last uh, call given the hour, and it's a very important point that you raise. First of all, hats off to you for listening to Crystal and Applebaum. You would actually have to have me uh, in irons in a dungeon and play it forcibly to me for me to have listened to it. But I'm glad you did, so the rest of us don't have to. But the, uh, the thesis of a fusion uh, between a rump Western Ukrainian state and Poland is one that I have been talking about throughout this whole 12, 13 months of uh, this stage of the war. Uh, I have many times drawn attention to the fact that Poland regards many parts of Ukraine as its own property, in particular the uh, ancient treasure of the city of Lvov. Uh, on the other side, many Western Ukrainians uh, in a very nationalistic, even chauvinist, xenophobic way, regard uh, Polish people as subhumans. That's why they were so easily able to massacre them in the Holocaust in the East when under the leadership of Bandera, uh, the nationalist and Nazi forces of Western Ukraine teamed up with Hitler and Himmler and literally massacred, up close and personal, no gas chambers for them, no, no, with knife and sword and gun and pistol, uh, they massacred many hundreds of thousands, indeed millions of people in the Holocaust in the East. So there's bad blood and scores to settle from the Polish point of view. And it would suit them fine. It would uh, uh, allow them to retake Lvov and remake it as a Polish city. It would achieve their uh, objective of being a, an intermare, M-A-R-E, uh, power uh, between the seas, between the two seas, uh, although not if Russia takes all of the coastline, they won't. Uh, but they uh, will be able to be a base camp uh, for war against Russia. However, I just make this point to you, Chris. 
you only get Article 5 protection in NATO if somebody attacks you. If you attack somebody else, then you don't have Article 5 protection under the NATO treaty. So if Poland did become uh, a base camp for terrorist operations against Russia in a post-conflict situation, Russia would be legally, of course, entirely within its rights to hop pursue the terrorists into their base camp in Poland. And Poland would not be able to claim that it was under attack because it would be abundantly obvious that Poland was, in fact, the power doing the attacking. Thanks for that, Chris. I mentioned earlier Joe Biden. Uh, I wonder if my friends have managed to get the video of Joe Biden getting lost in a factory. There he is. Now, they, look at the way he's walking. They've talked, they've told him, they've painted blue arrows. He's about to walk off to the right. Now he's going back uh, to the left and a functionary has appeared to take him. Now, everybody should be laughing at that video, but they really should be laughing at themselves because we are the people that, if you're an American, you allowed to him to become your president. If you're a European, you've allowed him to give your country orders, even orders that might well take you over the cliff into nuclear catastrophe. Now, you know, if he was uh, Kirk Douglas or even Burt Lancaster, if he was Sean Connery, if he was Jack Kennedy, you could understand why people might want to follow him. It would still be wrong, but you could understand it from a human point of view. This man is a real leader. Let's follow him. But you saw him there on that video. And you're still following him. You're allowing him to lead you into catastrophe. And so the joke is on us. The laughter should not be at that daft old Egypt who couldn't find his backside with a bit of toilet paper. It's us that should be being laughed at. We are the fools. The joke is on us. And if people can't see that, well, I despair. And all of my life's work has been in vain. That is, alas, all that I've got time for. But the good news is that, God willing, I'll be back again on Sunday night at the earlier time of 7 p.m. Don't forget, Moats in German will be along in a minute in May. Get uh, ready for that. Be ready to rumble with me on Wednesday, on Sunday rather, at 7 p.m. for the mother of all talk shows. Good night.